Dr. Michio Kaku is one of the world's most widely recognized scientists. He has written several international bestsellers and five New York Times bestsellers, including his latest work, The God Equation, The Quest for the Theory of Everything. Professor Kaku is the science correspondent for the national CBS This Morning program. He has also hosted numerous science specials ranging across the spectrum of news and entertainment networks, from the Discovery Channel to the Science Channel, BBC, National Geographic, the History Channel, and more. If you watch morning shows or late night talk shows or broadcast news where a science expert is involved, you've probably seen or heard from Professor Kaku. Aside from being a sought after expert in the media, he is also a professor of theoretical physics. One of his stated goals is to complete Einstein's dream of a theory of everything, to derive an equation which will summarize all the physical laws of the universe. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Kaku in recognition for being presented the Arthur C. Clarke Lifetime Achievement Award for exceptional contributions as a theoretical physicist, a futurist, and a science popularizer. Welcome, Professor Kaku. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us. And, and as we consider the variety and impact of your work, it's tough to know what questions to begin with. It seems you've touched so many things from creating string field theory to teaching university courses about time travel, consulting on space exploration, writing about the mind and extraterrestrial life, and even building a Betatron particle accelerator in your parents' garage. So with all that being said, what sparked you to become a physicist and take on such a significant scientific challenge? People sometimes ask me, what does it take to become a scientist? Do you have to have lots of math? Well, it helps to be able to math, but most important, you have to have imagination. You have to be able to innovate. You have to be able to see beyond the known laws of science. And for me, it all started when I was eight years old. The newspaper said that a great scientist had just died. And they put a picture of his desk on the evening news. And on his desk was a book, an open book. And the caption said that the greatest scientist of our time could not finish this book. Well, I was flabbergasted. What? A great scientist could not finish that book? I mean, what's the problem? Why couldn't he go to the library? Why couldn't he ask his mother? Why couldn't he finish this book? Well, I had to know the answer. So I went to the library and I found out this man's name was Albert Einstein. And that book flashed around the world was the unfinished theory of everything. An equation no more than one inch long that would allow us to quote, read the mind of God. Well, I was hooked. I had to know everything about this man, this theory. And I said to myself, I want to be part of this mission to help complete that book. And as you mentioned, when I was in high school, I decided to build an atom smasher to fulfill my dream. I went to Westinghouse. I got 500 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire. And I built a 2 million electron volt beta particle accelerator in my mom's garage. Every time I plugged it in, I would blow out all the circuit breakers in the house. The whole house would be plunged in darkness. And my poor mom, she would say to herself, why couldn't I have a son who plays baseball? Maybe if I buy him a basketball. And for God's sake, why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Why does he have to build these machines in the garage? Well, these machines got me a scholarship to Harvard where I could pursue my dream of a theory of everything. And that's what I do for a living. That's my day job, to try to complete Einstein's dream of a fable theory of everything, an equation perhaps no more than one inch long that will summarize all the laws of the universe. A lot of people are interested in understanding things that they don't know, which leads to teaching, leads to instruction. I, I thought I'd ask, what inspires you to be a university professor to help expand people's imagination, to express their ideas, and basically what we're talking about with the Arthur C. Clarke Awards. I think most people, when they first hear about science, they're enamored of it. Uh, we're born scientists. We want to know where we came from, where the stars came from, why the stars shine. But then something happens. 
something happens which destroys this spark of interest. So what is the greatest destroyer of young scientists known to science? I think it is junior high school. Because we're born scientists. We want to know where we came from. We want to know where the stars shine. Until we hit junior high school, and then science is made boring. I mean, it's memorize the parts of a flower. Memorize this. Memorize that. Why? I mean, what rhyme or reason is there a logic to just memorizing all the minerals, memorizing the parts of a flower? Uh, my daughter once took the Regents exam in New York State, and she took it in geology. So I thought, oh, great. I could tutor her. Geology is a lot of fun. You learned about the fundamental principles behind the recycling of rock. You learned about the life history of rock when it spews out of volcanoes and turns into igneous rock and then so on and so forth. Or earthquakes. Why we know what the center of the earth looks like because of vibrations through the earth. Well, I saw a copy of the exam and I felt like ripping that exam in half. It was memorize the names of all the crystals. No rhyme or reason, just spew out all the names, memorize the names of all these things. And then my daughter comes up to me and says, Daddy, why would anyone want to become a scientist? And I felt humiliated. Because here's my own daughter, who's now a doctor, by the way, saying that this stuff is so boring so irrelevant, why would anyone want to learn it? You see, I think science is based on principles, concepts, things that make sense and allow you to summarize vast amounts of trivia rather than learn the names of all the trivia. Let me tell you a story. Richard Feynman, the famous Nobel laureate, when he was a child, he remembered that his father would take him to the forest and explain to him birds, why birds are shaped the way they are, the coloration, the beaks. He would explain to the young Feynman everything about birds. Well, then one day, people realized that, yeah, the young Feynman knew a lot about birds. So a bully comes up to him and says, hey, Dick, what's the name of that bird over there? Well, the young Feynman said to himself, I know everything about that bird. I know why it's colored that way, how it flies, its beak, its shape, how it feeds. I know everything about that bird, except its name. So the young fireman said, I don't know. And then the bully said, what's the matter, Dick? You stupid or something? And in that instant of time, Feynman discovered a fundamental law of how we teach science. Most people think science is memorizing trivial details of no consequence whatsoever. Most people think that's what science is, learning fancy names for things that are just totally perpendicular to their life. And then you begin to realize that that's what's wrong with our educational system. Our educational system stresses learning irrelevant facts rather than principles concepts, things that allow you to explain vast amounts of data like evolution, like relativity, like quantum theory, th things that allow you to explain the universe rather than recite names which have no consequence whatsoever. And so unfortunately, when we teach science in our high schools and junior high schools, we do actually a very good job a very good job of explaining science up to 1950. Now, there's a problem there. We don't live in 1950. But yes, science, as it's taught in schools, can do a good job of teaching kids to live in 1950. But we don't live in 1950 anymore. We live in a world of the internet, of computers, of biotechnology, nanotechnology. That's the world we live in. And that's not the way we teach science. And I think that's one of the reasons why young people are turned off to science. We teach science incorrectly. Science is not memorization of details. It's concepts, 
principles that allow you to summarize vast amounts of information and explain why the universe is the way it is. Take a look at evolution. Evolution allows you to explore vast amounts of data about the living world. Or the quantum theory allows you to explain atoms, which in turn allows you to explain chemistry, which in turn allows you to explain most of the chemical world that we see around us. And that's the way we should teach science. My favorite Einstein quote is, if a theory cannot be explained to a child, the theory is probably useless. Meaning that all great theories can be explained to children because they're based on pictures, concepts, principles. Newtonian mechanics can be explained in terms of cannonballs, rockets, things that move. Relativity can be explained in terms of clocks, meter sticks, and rockets. So we're talking about the fact that great theories are not just based on mathematics. Great theories are based on principles, principles that children can understand. String theory is based on music, the music of tiny vibrating strings. That's the way we should teach science. So lastly, Sir Arthur is quoted as saying, the limits of the possible can only be defined by going beyond them into the impossible. His perspective points to a powerful tool we all have that can be used to shape a positive future, our imagination. What advice do you have for people to exercise and unleash their imaginations, to search for or derive their own theories and actions to improve mankind, to improve our future, or maybe just improve each other? I often quote from Arthur C. Clarke, and I often quote from that passage about the impossible. In fact, I wrote a book, a New York Times bestseller, Physics of the Impossible trying to take the impossible, like time travel and things like that, and break it down. Break it down as to exactly where the known laws of physics begin to break down or not. So I think imagination, the imagination of the impossible is the key to progress. It's the key to innovation. The imagination, the creativity of thinking about the impossible is what makes us human. We humans, have the imagination to think about the impossible. And we have the courage to think about things that are bizarre about the future. Let me tell you a famous story. One day, Wolfgang Pauli, winner of the Nobel Prize, came to Columbia University here in New York to give a talk. Pauli claimed that he had the final theory, the theory of everything, the unified field theory, the theory that would allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. And he presented his version of the theory of everything. Well, Niels Bohr, founder of the quantum theory, was in the audience. Niels Bohr, at the end of the talk, stood up. And he said, Professor Pauli, we in the back of the audience are convinced that your theory is crazy. But what divides us in the back is whether or not your theory is crazy enough. And then they begin into an argument. Polly saying, my theory is crazy. It is crazy enough. And Bohr saying, no, your theory is not crazy enough. Now, a normal person would have thought that we physicists were nuts. Nuts, because we thought that it's a badge of courage to be founder of a crazy theory. But you see, all the easy theories were tried. All the easy theories were shown to be incorrect. Therefore, the only theory left was the crazy ones. And the crazy theory had to be so crazy that it eluded the greatest minds of the century to create a theory of everything. And that's what I think physics, the imagination, and what science fiction is all about. To find things that are crazy enough to be true.